Hello and welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. This is the show that brings together leading minds in energy to discuss the latest challenges and trends transforming and modernizing the utility industry of the future. And a quick thank you to Wes Monroe, our sponsor of today's show. Now, let's talk energy. My name is Jason Price, Energy Central podcast host and director with West Monroe, coming to you from New York City. And always, I'm joined by Matt Chester, Energy Central podcast producer and community manager, dialing in from Orlando, Florida. Matt, when it comes to advances in the generation side of energy, the focus has largely been on how to transition from one energy source to another. But from a utility business standpoint, a critical topic of importance is how to keep generators running at all times to maintain the high quality electron flow to the grid and overall performance. These utility scale generation systems are massive in size and the workhorse of utilities generation mix. They don't just operate from the click of a switch as we may like to think. So Matt, can you give us a bit of a background on this topic for our audience? Well, Jason, I don't know that I can give as good of a background as our guests will be able to do, but like you said, Customers expect that they can flip the switch and there's no question that they'll have power coming from their, their systems. This instantaneous demand must be met every step of the way with supply. And as the power mix continues to add intermittent renewables, as well as dispatchable central power plants, as these assets stretch further across the globe, and that as central generators experience outages, both expected ones for maintenance and unexpected ones from asset failure, the job of ensuring that the grid stays humming reliably and without question from the customer is what makes the utility sector so complex these days. But our guest today is one of the experts working on yet another solution that can help ease these challenges. That's great. And yeah, you're absolutely right. Our next guest will have a lot more to add to it. And I'm sure you've generated a lot of interest that will power our discussion. Sorry, Matt, I couldn't resist. As Matt described, maximizing both power reliability and utility profits is indeed top priority to making this whole system work. But unexpected events come up all the time that create disruptions and interruptions. But if those hiccups can be anticipated and ultimately prevented, then that becomes a huge win for the utilities. Our guest today has brought about a groundbreaking way to advance these principles through data collection and tracking on the generation side. We more often hear about such practices on the T&D aspects of the power sector, so the possibilities he's opening up can indeed be quite valuable. So joining us today is Steve Turner, a technical leader and protection pioneer at Arizona Public Service. And recently, he shared the results of his pioneering work at the IEEE Power System Relay Committee. And we wanna get a deep dive into operating and maintaining the health of a generator a system that we so much depend on in our everyday lives. So let's bring him into the podcast booth. Steve Turner of Arizona Public Service. Welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. Howdy, and thanks for inviting me. Absolutely, we're thrilled to have you on. So Steve, before we dive into this topic, I'd love to hear more about your journey in the utility sector. How did you get started in energy, and what does this role with EPS entail? Okay, so when I was an undergraduate, I went to Virginia Tech, which is a, a very good engineering school, and I decided to go into electrical engineering. And as an undergraduate, you know, I wanted to pay for as much of my education as I could. I was a co-op student with Dominion at the time, which Dominion is an, it's a very good electric utility. So that kind of like got me exposed to the electric utility industry. And then my junior and senior years, we had a professor come. His name's Dr. Aaron Fadke, and he became in charge of the power program there. And he is an amazing individual. He was a pioneer behind phaser measurement units and all kinds of stuff. And uh, I know the first class that I took with him my junior year was transmission line theory, and he just blew my mind. And it was like, I was undecided what I wanted to do with my career, but taking that class with him really made me decide I wanted to go into the power industry. And then he is an expert on protection. So he had a protection course and I, you know, so I took all those classes. So, you know, it's, it's a long road. 
I wanted to work for electric utility when I graduated, but I went back to graduate school and I got a master's in electrical engineering. And then I studied uh, steady state stability. And I did a, a project on that where we were actually looking at the uh, Florida at one time had stability problems with the rest of the country. So we actually did a project where we installed some equipment at the northernmost Florida Power and Light 500 TV substation. And we were able to actually do a real-time assessment, say there was a fault on a 500 kV line. Would Florida, would it remain stable or would it go unstable? You know, so that was really fun. And then I got a job. I went to work for a British relay manufacturer. So I got to work with utilities all throughout the U.S. So I started my career. I was really focused on transmission line protection, which is very exciting because that's very complicated and it's just very interesting protection. And I did that for a long time and I ended up, finally, I got an opportunity to work for a utility. I went to work for Duke later in my career and I started off in transmission and I was in the Carolinas and they had a position to come open, interested in in Florida. So I went down to Florida. Again, I was working in their transmission department doing system protection. And, you know, by this time I had well over 15 years experience under my belt. I was considered an expert on transmission line protection, but this project came along. This is typical for most electric utilities. The generator protection is typically handled by the transmission department, by their system protection department. Most utilities in the U.S., the generation departments, they don't handle the protection that falls to the transmission. But anyway, so a generation protection project came, and there was another protection engineer there. You know, he was very experienced, very smart guy, and they gave the project to him. And I could just see that he was very stressed out about that project because he had basically no knowledge on generator protection. And um, that was something that caught my attention. And I thought about that. And then I knew that Beckwith Electric, they're in Florida. They make generator protection products. So anyway, you know, I, I knew transmission really well. And I thought to myself, you know, maybe it's time to for a sea change and maybe I need to try to learn more about generator protection. So I was able to get a job with them and I worked there for 15 years and generator protection. There's not a lot of people that, you know, compared to like T and D, there's just a small number of people that are familiar with how generator protection works. So, you know, being there 15 years, I learned it really well. And then segueing into Arizona public service, uh, they actually contacted me and recruited me and they, wanted me to be in charge of their system protection. They were had decided, their generation department had decided that they wanted to do the protection themselves and they wanted me to head that up. And it was just too good of an offer to pass by, you know? So I went there and I've been there going on four to five years now. And I came at a really good time because they, we have a lot of projects where we're updating the generator protection equipment at a lot of our power plants. So I was able to create a new standard and I've been very instrumental in that. And it's really been fun, a lot of fun. You know, I really Perfect. love working the job that I have now. It's, you know, I feel appreciated. So perfect. I'm going to, Steve, I'm going to jump in. So this is, this is a great segue to my next question. So first of all, I think we need a quick definition from you on what is it meant by generator protection? And then second as a follow-up is really, you know, share with us, uh, you know, like a high level, what was the main message that came out of the presentation you gave at the IEEE? So go ahead. Okay, so for generators, you know, we have these large generators. I'm sure you've seen generation plants when you're driving around, you know, but that's the bulk of our power comes from these generation plants. So you'll have these large generators. They could be 100, 200, 500, even. We have Palo Verde, that's a nuclear power plant. I work with them too. And they have generators that are over a thousand megawatts, you know. So that's the bulk of our power system where we get our power sources. Renewables are a really big thing, but it's not going to replace the plants anytime soon, if ever. So these generators, you can have abnormal conditions occur, which I won't go into detail, but 
say a particular abnormal condition occurs, then you need to get the generator offline, you know, and shut that generator down to prevent damage coming from it. You know, say, say a transmission line, say a lightning bolt strikes a transmission line. Basically, what the protection does is it opens the circuit breakers at each end of the transmission line. That would be two substations. They de-energize a line. The lightning strike is gone, and then they reclose in. They reclose the line back in, and bam, everything, you're right back to normal operation. It's not that way with the generator. If a generator gets tripped offline, it's not going to be coming back on time. It's not going to be coming back online anytime soon. You have to find out what was the root cause. Was there any potential that there was damage done to the generator? And then you have to get all that squared away and make sure that the generator is okay. And then you can bring it back online. So it's it's a much bigger deal whenever the generator protection operates. So the protection is their relays, their computer relays, they are monitoring the health of the generator and they can quickly detect when something is wrong and they will trip breakers, take the turbine off and do whatever's necessary to isolate that generator. Okay, and then going into IEEE, that's the Institute of Electronic and Electrical Engineers. They have a group called the uh, Power System Relay Committee. You have to be invited to be a member of the group. So that's something I'm very proud of that I was invited. But um, they have subcommittees. One subcommittee is rotating machinery. That obviously covers generation. So anyway, I had said earlier that you know, the protection that we use for the generators, it's, they're basically computers. So you have all of this digital information inside of these devices. And I just feel like if you're familiar with condition monitoring, that by taking this data from the relay and mining it, it's possible that we can do trending and determine if a problem is developing. And that means that you don't wait until the problem occurs but that you're seeing that a problem is slowly developing over time. So then like generators, they typically run most of the year and then there'll be say a month, they take the generator offline and do maintenance. So if we have these type of monitoring algorithms, then what we can do is if we see a problem is coming when the maintenance is scheduled, we can examine the generator at that time to see if yes, there is something that going to happen and we can take steps to mitigate that. And I, okay. I gave a presentation at the last committee meeting and it was very well received. That's great to hear. So I want to, I want to ask you, there's a, there's a term, some terminology here that's new to me and maybe you can help um, define it for our audience, assuming that it's maybe new to them as well. But I also want you to, you know, take it a step further and, and basically translate what does this all mean for the health of the system? And the term I'm referring to is, and you told me this in the uh, in the prep call that we had, that tracking of capacitance. So, you know, what exactly is the the art of tracking capacitance, and and how and again, how does that translate to monitoring the health of the of the generation system? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, to really know what capacitance is, it helps to be an electrical engineer. But anyway, it's a, uh, it's an attribute of the generator. Think the best way to think of it is. When you have a generator, you have a stator winding. So there's that winding could have hundreds and hundreds of turns. You have the rotor spinning that induces a voltage on the stator, which then makes power. The power flows out of the generator into the transmission system. So there's a certain amount of capacitance associated with that stator winding. So the stator has two ends, one end is the neutral end, and that's where it's grounded. And then the other end is that that's where you connect it to the power system. So basically that capacitance is a parameter that is from the winding to ground. So it's it's a distributed parameter. So you have so much capacitance per turn. So anyway, what you can do is to mathematically model it you could split the total capacitance. You could put one half of the total capacitance at the terminal side of the generator, and you could put the other half at the neutral side of the generator. And now, so what happens is over time, 
the capacitance, it has a fixed value, but that value can change based on things such as contamination. So if the capacitance starts to get contaminated, that could be, say, water, you know, possibly, then the magnitude of the capacitance will increase over time. So we recently installed a new computer relay for one of our generators at a local plant here in Phoenix. And it takes measurement, voltage measurements, that by looking at those voltage measurements, you can actually determine what is the value of total capacitance at any particular time. So you have, what you do is you have a database, you know, so say day one is the first time you do that measurement. So you take that measurement and then you just do it periodically over time. And you just look to see is that value of capacitance increasing over time. If it is starting to increase, you know that you probably have a problem developing. So that's basically, that's how it works, you know, without getting into the nuts and bolts and all the theory, that's like a very high level way of explaining how it works. And what the beauty of this is, you can take these measurements at any time, you know, when the generator is operating, whereas otherwise, the only time you would be able to do it is during maintenance is when the generator is offline, which is, that could be, you know, utilities have different periods or, you know, between times when they take a generator out of service to do maintenance. So, you know, being able to do it continuously on a day-by-day basis, if you wanted to, versus one time per year, I think you can see the advantages of being able to do it on a continuous basis versus once every one or two years. Yeah, I understood. I mean, so let's just put it this way. Not having those signals, you run the risk of it breaking down when you least expected it. So it sounds like this, the strategy you've created has helped with some of the monitoring and reporting on the health of the, of the generation system long before it breaks down, which is just you know so critical and so key to keeping, things, keeping lights on, basically. So given all this, why aren't more utilities you know, adopting these kinds of practices that you've helped develop? Well, you know, let's say we have the generation department. I'm in the protection group. You know, there is monitoring equipment that's installed on generators, you know, but it, that could be done by other people. And anyway, so this is just another tool that we have at our disposal. And what's nice about it is that we can remotely communicate with that relay so that we have access to this information at any time. So it's just, like I said, you know, measuring the capacitance is something that they can't really do until now. It's when the generator is in a maintenance mode. So this is something, it's a new tool that people will have that they can use that they didn't have before. Right. So what's yeah, most, the... most problems that happen with generators there's all kinds of things that can happen, but the most common problems that you have are related to the stator. You know, this is a really good thing to, to measure because so many times when there is a problem that is related to the stator. Yep. Okay. So, you know, there's got to be a change management component of this. So it's really just sort of like changing some of the work processes that have been established for a long time. So I'm curious, what's been the general feedback from the audience when you gave this presentation? Were, were they... Were they are they still deliberating on it? Is it been um, now being worked on worked into the plans of uh, utilities? I mean, just what's the general feedback you've heard from your peers in the space? Well, what I would say is, you know, this is something that when we release the report, you know, then utilities will have the opportunity to read the report. It will outline how the the technique or the algorithm works. You know, and other utilities if they wanted to adopt it, they could do it themselves. Gotcha. All right. So then uh, I guess it sounds like the next steps of all this is really just letting the the industry sort of absorb it and see how best to integrate into their processes in, in one form or another. Is that, is that the general idea? Yes. And also I was at Western Protective Relay Conference October this year, and I gave a presentation. It wasn't just on this. There was other things I talked about as well, but, you know, that was kind of one of the main topics. It was very well received there as well. You know, and you have electrical engineers, protection engineers from the all over the U.S. and outside of the U.S. attending. So it was very well received there as well. That's great. Well, congratulations on developing this 
you know, this bit of pioneering innovation for um, for the industry. It's no doubt even going to be more critical, especially as weather events, you know, bad actors mm -hmm. and other um, sort of outside forces, including internally, raise potential risks and create potential risks on our on our generation system. So, congratulations on um, on the accomplishment that you've that you've made. I'm sure, it's going to be. Um, Continue to be well received in the industry, and something that I would expect would be adopted uh, wide scale at, as the as the technology continues to mature in the in the marketplace. So, okay. So, with that said, Steve, congratulations there, and congratulations for making it this far in the podcast. At this point, we we're going to pivot to what we call the lightning round, which gives us an opportunity to learn more about Steve Turner, the person, rather than Steve Turner, the professional. We have a series of questions, five questions we're going to ask you, and we ask you to either give a one word or one phrase response. So are you ready? Yes, sir. Okay. What is your all-time favorite movie? Hmm. I probably Immortal Beloved. Best way to unwind after a long day? I like to go out and have a beer and watch a football game. What's your best tip for giving presentations to an intimidating group like those at the IEEE? Okay. It's more than just a phrase. It's basically, you have to know your subject very well, and you have to be confident. And if you know your subject very well, then you don't really have anything to worry about. Nobody's going to be able to ask you a question that stumps you or, you know, they find some hole in your logic. So it, it's all about being well prepared. And I'm very lucky that throughout my career, I had mentors that were excellent at giving presentations and they shared their presentation skills with me, you know, so I, you know, putting together the presentation, what you're going to present and how you present it. That's a big part in being, giving a successful presentation. Who are your role models? Dr. Aaron Fatke was my first role model. And, you know, he was my professor when I was at Virginia Tech. The next mentor I had, I only had him for a week, but his name is J. Lewis Blackburn. He, at one time, was the chief application engineer for ABB in Westinghouse. Before that, I took a course with him when I was very early in my career. And there was, you know, the people in the course were young. I was very, I was like, say, 25, 26 at that time. You know, and the, a lot of the other students were protection engineers that worked for other utilities. And we just had, himself and I had a lot of amazing conversations, technical conversations. And I just realized that I could do a lot more with my career at that time. And it just, it changed me. When I came back from that training, I was a different person and I wanted to do a lot more with my career. After that, I said, I worked for a British relay manufacturer. I had three mentors there. One was the person that was in charge of the, uh, we had a, an office in New York City. So we would service, our service territory was the U.S. And he is an excellent protection engineer. And also he has excellent presentation skills. And I learned a lot about how to present from him. And then the factory that was located in England, the chief development engineer and the chief application engineer. I mean, these guys, I would say they were genius level between the two of them. There was no question that I could ask that I would not get an amazing answer. And they would give very thorough answers so that if you ask them a question and you phrase it well, they would answer it in such a way as that you would understand. And then after that, I'm just thinking, then when I worked for Beckwith Electric, Dr. Murdy Yala, uh, he's a fellow in the IEEE. He's another amazing person. And I just learned so much about generator protection from him. He was another mentor that I had. And I would say, you know, those gentlemen were the ones that really had a very strong influence on my career and being successful and getting to where I am today. You know, this is one thing I'll just say for young people. It's really important to know what you want to do with your career. And the best training you can get is on the job. And anywhere I ever worked, I would always try to find out who was the most knowledgeable, and I would ask lots of questions. You just can't wait for people to come to you when they're going to explain everything. It really doesn't work that way. You have to be active in seeking out mentors. 
Very true. And finally, in the question we ask most of our guests, if not all of them, is what are you most passionate about? I'm very passionate about my career. You know, it is a job, but it's also, it's almost like getting paid to do a hobby. I, I love protection. It's fascinating. And it's, it's just, you can always keep learning more. And I'm in a position now where I'm starting to be a mentor to, to young engineers here at APS, which is a fantastic situation to be in. So my job, is one of the things that I really love. I also have another hobby. The game that I play is a tabletop game. But uh, I think it's really important. For a long time, I was just really focused on my career. Um, I did mountain climbing for a while. That was the big thing. But uh, I finally got out of it because it's very dangerous. But that was that was something that was, uh, that was really the big thing in my life. But it's important to have something outside of your job is really important to you and you get a lot out of it. You just don't want to be, if, you know, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy is a very true statement. That's right. And, you know, everyone needs some balance in their life, no doubt. So congratulations again on the recognition in the industry and congratulations on getting through the lightning round. And so now at this point, we want to give you the final say. So knowing that you've got peers in the industry listening What are some of the takeaway messages you'd like them to take away and resonate with? I would just say that I follow a technical path and I always want to keep learning how to do new things, you know, and not just rest on my morals. You know, I want to keep learning new things. I think that's really important. And one thing I've done recently is I've enrolled in an online graduate program in artificial intelligence. I think that's the next big thing that's coming to the electric utility industry. So this, you know, if I'm successful, then I think that I'll have another skill set. You know, and this goes back to that project that I worked on where we were measuring the capacitance of the generator data winding. So, you know, always look for new things to gravitate towards and learn new things. And if you do that, it never gets stale. And I would also like to say it's like, I've seen some engineers, it's like, they kind of like, they get in the comfort zone. This is what I've seen for a lot of utility engineers is, uh, you know, you just kind of like get in your protection zone. You don't want to, you get in the zone of this is what I'm responsible for. And, you know, you kind of get cubby hold and that's, I don't think that's a good way to, you know, if you want to keep making advancements, you know, and reaching new plateaus, you know, if you've just defined what your responsibilities are and you don't want to learn new things, you're never going to advance. So it's really important to look for new ways to do things and, you know, even get involved in new technology. Mm -hmm. Never stop learning. Well stated there. All right. So, uh, Steve, this is a great conversation and we really appreciate your insight. And by the way, taking a complex uh, engineering language and methods, and you did a nice job turning it into everyday language for commoners like myself to understand. So I want to thank you for that. It's not an easy skill to have, and you clearly mastered it. So I want to thank you again for joining the podcast and speaking to our audience, your peers, and we hope you consider coming back uh, maybe a year from now to see how things have developed and see how your, your innovation has adopted in the industry. So thank you again for this fascinating discussion. We appreciate it immensely. Well, you're welcome, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this. And you can always reach Steve Turner through the Energy Central platform, where he welcomes your questions and comments. And we also want to give a shout-out of thanks to the podcast sponsors that made today's episode possible. Thanks to West Monroe. West Monroe works with the nation's largest electric, gas, and water utilities in their telecommunication, grid modernization, and digital and workforce transformations. Westmoreau brings a multidisciplinary team that blends utility, operations, and technology expertise to address modernizing aging infrastructure, advisory on transportation electrification, ADMS deployments, data and analytics, and cybersecurity. And once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. So plug in and stay fully charged in the discussion by hopping into the community at energycentral.com And we'll see you next time at the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast.